The Moon Metal, Chapter 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betsy Bush, in Marquette, Michigan, June 2007. The Moon Metal, by Garrett P. Service. Chapter 8. More of Dr. Six's Magic. Important business called me east soon after the meeting with Hall described in the foregoing chapter, and before I again saw the Grand Teton, very stirring events had taken place. As the reader is aware, Dr. Six's agreement with the various governments limited the output of his mine. An international commission, continually in session in New York, adjusted the differences arising among the nations concerning financial affairs, and allotted to each the proper amount of artemisium for coinage. Of course, this amount varied from time to time, but a fair average could easily be maintained. The gradual increase of wealth in houses, machinery, manufactured and artistic products called for a corresponding increase in the circulating medium, but this too was easily provided for. An equally painstaking supervision was exercised over the amount of the precious metal which Dr. Six was permitted to supply to the markets for use in the arts. On this side also, the demand gradually increased. But the wonderful Teton mine seemed equal to all calls upon its resources. After the failure of the mining operations, there was a moderate revival of the efforts to reduce the Teton ore, but no success cheered the experimenters. Prospectors also wandered all over the earth looking for pure artemisium, but in vain. The general public, knowing nothing of what Hall had discovered, and still believing Six's story that he also had found pure artemisium in his mine, accounted for the failure of the tunneling operations on the supposition that the metal, in a free state, was excessively rare, and that Dr. Six had had the luck to strike the only vein of it that the Grand Teton contained. As if to give countenance to this opinion, Dr. Six now announced, in the most public manner, that he had been deceived again, and that the vein of free metal he had struck being exhausted, no other had appeared. Accordingly, he said, he must henceforth rely exclusively, as in the beginning, upon reduction of the ore. Artemisium had proved itself an immense boon to mankind, and the new era of commercial prosperity which it had ushered in already exceeded everything that the world had known in the past. School-children learned that human civilization had taken five great strides, known respectively beginning at the bottom, as the age of stone, the age of bronze, the age of iron, the age of gold, and the age of artemisium. Nevertheless, sources of dissatisfaction finally began to appear, and after the nature of such things, they developed with marvelous rapidity. People began to grumble about contraction of the currency. In every country there arose a party which demanded free money. Demagogues pointed to the brief reign of paper money after the demonetization of gold as a happy period, when the people had enjoyed their rights, and the money barons, borrowing a term from nineteenth-century history, were kept at bay. Then came denunciations of the International Commission for Restricting the Coinage. Dr. Six was described as a devil-fish, sucking the veins of the planet, and holding it helpless in the grasp of his tentacular billions. In the United States, meetings of agitators passed furious resolutions, denouncing the government, assailing the rich, cursing Dr. Six, and calling upon the oppressed, to rise and take their own. The final outcome was, of course, violence. Mobs had to be suppressed by military force, but the most dramatic scene in the tragedy occurred at the Grand Teton. Excited by inflammatory speeches and printed documents, several thousand armed men assembled in the neighborhood of Jenny's Lake, and prepared to attack the Six Mine. For some reason, the military guard had been depleted, and the mob, under the leadership of a man named Bings, who showed no little talent as a commander and strategist, surprised the small force of soldiers and locked them up in their own guardhouse. 
telegraphic communication having been cut off by the astute Bings, a fierce attack was made on the mine. The assailants swarmed up the sides of the canyon and attempted to break in through the foundation of the buildings. But the masonry was stronger than they had anticipated, and the attack failed. Sharpshooters then climbed the neighboring heights and kept up an incessant peppering of the walls with conical bullets driven at four thousand feet per second. No reply came from the gloomy structure. The huge column of black smoke rose uninterruptedly into the sky, and the noise of the great engine never ceased for an instant. The mob gathered closer on all sides and redoubled the fire of the rifles, to which was now added the belching of several machine guns. Ragged holes began to appear in the walls, and at the sight of these the assailants yelled with delight. It was evident that the mill could not long withstand so destructive a bombardment. If the besiegers had possessed artillery, they would have knocked the buildings into splinters within twenty minutes. As it was, they would need a whole day to win their victory. Suddenly it became evident that the besieged were about to take a hand in the fight. Thus far they had not shown themselves or fired a shot, but now a movement was perceived on the roof, and the projecting arms of some kind of machinery became visible. Many marksmen concentrated their fire upon the mysterious objects, but apparently with little effect. Bings mounted on a rock, so as to command a clear view of the field, was on the point of ordering a party to rush forward with axes and beat down the formidable doors, when there came a blinding flash from the roof. Something swished through the air, and a gust of heat met the assailants in the face. Bings dropped dead from his perch, and then, as if the scythe of the destroyer had swung downward, and to right and left in quick succession. The close-packed mob was leveled, rank after rank, until the few survivors crept behind rocks for refuge. Instantly the atmospheric broom swept up and down the canyon and across the mountain's flanks, and the marksmen fell in bunches like shaken grapes. Nine-tenths of the besiegers were destroyed within ten minutes, after the first movement had been noticed on the roof. Those who survived owed their escape to the rocks which concealed them, and they lost no time in crawling off into neighboring chasms, and as soon as they were beyond eyeshot from the mill, they fled with panic speed. Then the towering form of Dr. Six appeared at the door, emerging without sign of fear or excitement. He picked his way among his fallen enemies, and approaching the military guardhouse, undid the fastening, and set the imprisoned soldiers free. "'I think I am paying rather dear for my whistle,' he said, with a characteristic sneer to Captain Carter, the commander of the troop. "'It seems that I must not only defend my own people and property when attacked by mob force, but must also come to the rescue of the soldiers, whose payrolls are met from my pocket.' The captain made no reply, and Dr. Six strode back to the works. When the released soldiers saw what had occurred, their amazement had no bounds. It was necessary at once to dispose of the dead, and this was no easy undertaking for their small force. However, they accomplished it, and at the beginning of their work made a most surprising discovery. "'How's this, Jim?' said one of the men to his comrade, as they stooped to lift the nearest victim of Dr. Six's withering fire. "'What's this fellow got all over him?' "'Artemisium! Pon my soul!' responded Jim, staring at the body. "'He's all coated over with it.' Immediately from all sides came similar exclamations. Every man who had fallen was covered with a film of the precious metal, as if he had been dipped into an electrolytic bath. Clothing seemed to have been charred, and the metallic atoms had penetrated the flesh of the victims. The rocks all round the battlefield were similarly veneered. "'It looks to me,' said Captain Carter, "'as if old Six had turned one of his spouts of artemisium into a hose-pipe, and soaked him with it.' "'That's it,' chimed in a lieutenant. "'That's exactly what he's done.' "'Well,' returned the captain, "'if he can do that, 
I don't see what use he's got for us here. Probably he don't want to waste the stuff, said the lieutenant. What do you suppose it cost him to plate this crowd? I guess a month's pay for the whole troop wouldn't cover the expense. It's costly, but then, gracious, wouldn't I have given something for the doctor's hose when I was a youngster campaigning in the Philippines in ninety nine? The story of the marvelous way in which Dr. Six defended his mill became the sensation of the world for many days. The hose pipe theory, struck off on the spot by Captain Carter, seized the popular fancy and was generally accepted without further question. There was an element of the ludicrous which robbed the tragedy of some of its horror. Moreover, no one could deny that Dr. Six was well within his rights in defending himself by any means when so savagely attacked, and his triumphant success, no less than the ingenuity which was supposed to underlie it, placed him in a heroic light which he had not hitherto enjoyed. As to the demagogues who were responsible for the outbreak and its terrible consequences, they slunk out of the public eye, and the result of the battle at the mine seemed to have been a clearing up of the atmosphere. Such as a thunderstorm affects at the close of a season of foul weather. But now, little as men guessed it, the beginning of the end was close at hand. End of chapter 8. This recording is in the public domain.